Hello, everyone. My name is Jim Seberg. I'm the Assistant Director for the Medical Cannabis Research Center at Drexel University. Today, we are proud to have Lauren Rabel, pharmacist for Zenleaf Dispensaries. Uh, she graduated from Duquesne University and previously worked in retail pharmacy uh, before beginning to work in uh, the PAMJ program in 2018. Um, since then, she's gained many uh, experiences in different aspects of the cannabis industry. As a role of pharmacist, continues to change specifically within that. Uh, Lauren started the first pharmacy student rotations in Pennsylvania and lectures at the University of Pittsburgh uh, in their School of Pharmacy on Cannabis Therapeutics. Lauren is also a uh, scientific advisor to Cannonigma, which is a science-based cannabis resource for consumers. She's also a member of Doctors for Cannabis Regulation um, and has also worked on several cannabis committees related to this. I'll pass it over to you, Lauren. If you want to get your uh, presentation set up and any other introduction you can offer. Sure thing. Thank you so much, Jim, for having me and for everyone who's listening today. Um, let me share my screen here. Okay, is that all up and running? Perfect. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay. Um, so today I will be going over what to expect at the dispensary for your first visit in the Pennsylvania Medical Marijuana Program. Before we begin, I would like to let everyone know that the opinions are of my own and not of my employers. Uh, but without further ado, let's get into it. Okay, so once you have been certified by one of the participating physicians within the medical marijuana program and you've received your card in the mail, you can head over to any dispensary of your choice. Uh, each dispensary operator might have slightly different uh, new patient procedures, but typically you'll show your ID at the door and be registered into the system. Uh, next, per the rules and regulations, the new patient is required to re meet with the dispensary medical professional, which is typically a pharmacist especially if the certifying doctor hasn't placed any restrictions or limitations on the patient's certification. Uh, the restrictions or limitations could be on the purchase quantities or the dosage formulations. The doctor could pr pretty much write whatever they would like to to guide you the best that they could for a safe interaction with cannabis. During your consultation, the patient can address any concerns that they are having regarding cannabis, their medical conditions, and their current medications. When it comes to my personal consultation style, I like to start by asking the patient to tell me a little bit about themselves. You know, if they've ever used cannabis before and how they want to use it, what's worked well for them, if, they're, if they know. Uh, then I'll go over the different routes of administration that we can utilize, such as inhalation, ingestion, or topical, and the various products that we offer in the medical marijuana program. Uh, we have inhalable products, which begin to work almost immediately and have a shorter dur duration of action than the ingestible products. When you ingest, whether that's chewing or swallowing, the products take a little bit longer to begin taking effect, but they also last a lot longer. Another thing that happens with ingestion is that our liver converts it to a much, much more potent metabolite. So there is a bit of difference between the two, and that can usually dictate the way the rest of the consultation goes. Uh, we also have topical and transdermal products and suppositories, and I guess I would see the up-and-coming trochies that are a part of our program now. A troche is a small medicated lozenge that is designed to easily dissolve inside the mouth, whether that's in between the cheek and the gum or underneath the tongue. Okay, so now that we've talked about the different routes of administration, uh, this is at the point where I usually like to ask the patient which product they're most comfortable with consuming. And I'll pull up the menu so that we can get more specific about that dosage formulation. Um, we'll take a look at the THC and CBD percentages and other cannabinoid content the terpene profiles, and proper consumption techniques in order to make sure that we find a product that's best suited for their needs. Okay, uh, so during the consultation, I get a lot of common questions where there are certain concerns that are kind of universal between each patient, uh, so we'll address some of those. Um, some patients don't want to feel too high. Uh, they're nervous or anxious about it, so they would like to avoid it. There are certain products that we can recommend to avoid the high feeling, whether they are lower dose products, so we start at low doses and increase slowly over time, or whether they contain CBD in them. CBD can be utilized to curb how high you would feel whenever you take a product that has CBD and THC together, because uh, we call this mechanistically a non-competitive allosteric modulator which is just a way to say that CBD will bind to the active site on the CB1 receptor, change the shape of the receptor, making it completely 
unable to bind with THC to feel the intoxication. Uh, can I purchase more than one product or different kinds of products? You are allowed to purchase and try more than one product or dosage formulation, so long as your certifying prescriber has not limited you or restricted you. In fact, patients are able to purchase up to 192 medical marijuana units in a 90-day period. Uh, so one medical marijuana, marijuana unit equals an eighth or three and a half grams of dry flour, one gram of a concentrate, or 100 milligrams of a THC-infused product such as an ingestible or topical. Uh, will I be able to buy this product again if it works? The product availability depends on plant that grows in a 90-day cycle, and it might have varying testing results with each, bath, with each batch, so it's possible that the same product isn't available at your next visit. Thankfully, we can typically find a substitute that is nearly identical um, and has similar testing results. This wasn't always the case in this medical marijuana program. I remember there was a time period where we had a, uh, a product demand. Um, we really, really needed more products on the market and we had a little bit of a drought. But now we're in the place where there is so much supply that we do have plenty of substitutable products. Um, and if one dispensary doesn't have it, you're able to check the online menus to see if another one does. I found throughout five and a half years of being in the program that uh, the patients that are able to travel for the product that works for them certainly will. How do I order online? So online ordering can certainly be an adventure for patients and dispensaries have come a long way since the very beginning of the program when we were using paper handouts in store. Now you're able to look at the menu, um, at the privacy of your own home, order, and then go to the dispensary same day for pickup. Uh, on the menus, you'll always find the name of the product and THC or CBD percentages, but not every dispensary lists all of the information that patients need to know, like the ingredients as well as the terpene profiles. To me personally, that's something that I need to know in order to make an educated purchase ahead of time. But you can always meet with the dispensary personnel in store to discuss the products and the certificate of analysis is, if that's necessary for you. Um, you don't need to pay ahead of time for your products before you get to the dispensary and most orders are only available for same day pickup. So if you don't make it there to pick it up on, on time by the end of the day, they will just place it back to stock and you can place an order again the next day. Okay, are there any discounts? So products aren't covered by health insurance and they can get costly, especially if you build up a high tolerance. The good news is that some, uh, some workers' compensation claims will cover them for you retroactively, and the Department of Health has a medical marijuana assistance program for those who are eligible. Uh, this assistance program will uh, not only weigh the fee, the yearly fee that's owed to the Department of Health for caregivers and patients that are eligible, but they also give patients a $50 allowance per month towards products. Um, additionally, dispensaries are able to provide promotions on products that you can view the same day on the menu. Uh, they also might provide specific discounts to certain demographics like veterans, seniors, students, etc. Can I buy a pre-roll? So we do sell flour in Pennsylvania. However, we don't sell pre-rolls because um, combusting flour is not permissible in our program. Vaporization is. So combusting flour is taking an open flame and lighting something on fire. So no joints, no bongs, no pre-rolls, unfortunately. And then are edibles legal? Unfortunately, edibles are also not allowed in the program due to their attractiveness to children. Um, I would argue that it's very difficult to give a child a medication if it's not palatable. However, patients in our program are able to purchase flour themselves, tinctures, RSO, distillates, anything else that's available to infuse them into a food product or something edible um, to aid in absorption. Additionally, as I mentioned before, the trochies are available and they're very similar to the gummies that are sold and available in other states programs. Okay, now moving on to talking about adverse events. So now that you've had your first visit to the dispensary, you go home and you try the product. Hopefully everything works well, that's our end goal here and you found relief, but sometimes patients experience side effects or other events that are problematic. An adverse event is defined as harm caused by an appropriate or inappropriate use of a drug. 
These can be expected and unexpected, but they're required to be deported, reported to the Department of Health when they occur. And there's a form online for the medical professional at the dispensary to fill out. If you experience an adverse event related to a cannabis product, you should speak with that medical professional uh, in order to report it. There are several different types of adverse events that we can see in the cannabis industry that include allergic reactions and hypersensitivity reactions. Um, I've seen a few of patients develop rashes or hive after topical or oral consumption, including inhalation. Um, some patients have felt their throat and their tongue even swell up. And in one particular patient, we narrowed it down to a very specific terpene. And as long as we avoided that terpene in products, we were able to prevent this from occurring. Uh, but the reaction that I've seen the most numerous times over the past five and a half years is over medication. It's really, really easy to overconsume cannabis, uh, especially when you ingest it. And it's very difficult to gauge your tolerance when you are cannabis naive. That's why you'll hear us say time and time again to start with a low dose and increase slowly. It's also not a bad idea to uh, remind patients to wait up to a whole hour before redosing if you think you need another dose, because it could be possible that you haven't felt the effects yet, an additional dose would stack and cause over medication. Uh, some products are extremely potent, even the inhalable ones, and a little bit more certainly could ruin your day if you consume just a teeny amount more. Uh, this is a huge reason why having the medical professional in the dispensary is extremely necessary to provide these necessary warnings, uh, as well as make appropriate recommendations. Uh, the most common way that I've seen this occur in adverse event reporting is that a patient will go into the dispensary and just ask for the strongest product because they're having a ton of debilitating pain. No more questions are asked about tolerance or past experience and the patient goes home with RSO or Rick Simpson oil, which is a very, very potent product and they just a little bit too much. Uh, in the case of over-medication, you might feel as though you are dying or that it's a medical emergency. However, that's typically not the case unless you're a child, you have a heart condition, or you take medications that suppress your central nervous system, specifically ones that cause respiratory depression. The most common symptoms of over-medication are feeling overly sedated, uh, an increase in anxiety that leads to paranoia or hallucinations, distorted sense of time, headache, nausea, and vomiting. I don't necessarily recommend seeking treatment at the ER because most adults who experience over medication are likely ret to return to baseline in the following day, if not sooner. If an extremely large dose was consumed, it could even take longer. The best thing to do if you feel like you've consumed too much is to not panic. It can be a little bit difficult, but find a calm and relaxing place uh, that you can sit and hang out for a while. Even better if there's a distraction like watching TV, uh, on your couch with a comfortable blanket, and also drink plenty of water and stay hydrated. Um, you'll see on the internet that a lot of people will recommend taking CBD when you feel it, when there's over medication. And I don't do that for a few reasons though. First, it could prolong the effects of THC making the unpleasant list last longer. Second, it could be appealing to take a large dose of CBD thinking you need to rescue yourself. You don't. High doses of CBD themselves can be sedating and add on to the effect that you're feeling. And then third, CBD minimally helps lower the THC concentrations. It's probably too late at this point to utilize that cushioning effect that TB CBD has for the intoxicating effects. However, it may be worth trying if you're particularly suffering and feeling the anxious feelings and paranoia. Uh, a third type of adverse event that is much debated about is cannabis hyperemesis syndrome. And the debate is over what causes it, as a lot of people believe that it is simply chronic use of THC uh, specifically higher doses of THC, and others think it could be related to other factors such as uh, pesticides or a combination of them. Regardless of the cause, uh, cannabis hyperemesis syndrome presents itself uh, initially as feelings of mild nausea uh, to more severe with cramping and then back to baseline again in these stages. It can be very, very uncomfortable and some patients will even seek uh, help at the emergency rooms. The one thing, regardless of how it's caused, we know that, that these patients have a few things in common, and one is that they are a chronic consumer of cannabis and that they've found reliefs with hot baths or showers, so much so that they might even take more than one a day. Other types of adverse events can occur due to proper 
improper use of the medication, uh, as well as drug interactions, which takes us to our next slide. So there are theoretical drug interactions based on how we understand how cannabis works in the body and how the body interacts with cannabis. I say theoretical because although there are hundreds, if not thousands of anticipated interactions, there are not very many interactions that we actually see happening in patients. So essentially there are very few drugs, if any, that you cannot use with cannabis. And even then, there are often recommendations that we can follow or monitoring param parameters uh, to follow along the patients to ensure that you know everything's a-okay and this isn't detrimental to their health and their outcomes. Um, I say this because you know some patients have tried every single medication and cannabis is the only thing that provides them relief. So in that scenario, the benefit outweighs the risks of the interaction. Some interactions can actually be prevented or counseled upon. One of those examples if, is if the patient is taking an antihypertensive medication. We know that THC can increase blood pressure as well as heart rate. And this side effect can be avoided by following the advice to start with a low dose and increase slowly over time if a higher dose is needed. The specific medications that myself as a pharmacist I'm personally on a high alert for are warfarin, clobazam, valproic acid, theophylline, phenytoin, tacrolimus, um, maintenance antifungals, and antiretroviral anti medications. I'd also like to mention that we haven't exactly been able to do as much research as possible on every drug interaction that exists due to the federal status, uh, severely limiting our ability to do this research. So I personally always double check the mechanism of action of the drug, as well as how it's metabolized within the body for any newer medications, just to make sure that there isn't any area of concern. Uh, other health issues or concerns related to cannabis that we need to that we can consider or ponder about um, are is cannabis induced schizophrenia or psychosis. There's a lot of concern over cannabis induced psychosis or schizophrenia. And I just mentioned a little bit ago that overconsumption can actually lead to states of paranoia and or hallucinations. The big question though is which came first, the schizophrenia or the cannabis? Uh, we know that there is research that supports the correlation is there. There's no denying that. A moment of questioning whether cannabis actually causes schizophrenia itself or if the individuals were already susceptible and have a predisposition to developing schizophrenia. The one thing that I would recommend, though, is that if you have a familial history of schizophrenia or you suffer from issues with mental illness, is to really take the phrase start low and increase slowly, seriously, and uh, as well as be conscious of your dosage. Uh, avoid high THC products because they could be a slippery slope for you. And check in frequently with yourself to make sure your cannabis use is helping your mental health. Um, this goes for the other conditions such as depression, anxiety, and PTSD as well. Uh, there are also concerns about the long-term effects on cannabis on the lungs. It's not recommended for those with respiratory issues to smoke or vape cannabis and instead should utilize ingestible or topical products because smoking and vaping can irritate the lungs, leading to worsening of symptoms. Um, same goes for cardiovascular issues because cannabis can increase blood pressure. Certain patients need to be careful with their dosages. Okay, and that wraps it up on uh, the topics discussed on what goes on at the dispensary and how we find the right products. Great, Lauren. Yeah, so a couple questions here on my end. Um, if you wouldn't mind, stop sharing the screen. Thanks. And then um, I had some conversations previously about um, products sold at like gas stations or convenience stores, CBD, Delta 8, THC. Right. Um, how is it different than what is at the dispensary and kind of what is your guidance that you typically give to people? Sure. So these products are regulated under the farm bill and have different quality and safety parameters than in the medical marijuana program. Um, many people would even say that these regulations aren't being strictly enforced because there's some research that has come out that these products might not contain exactly what they claim to contain. So that there might not be any CBD in them, or they could contain too much THC in them to be allowed. Um, but there's also studies that have revealed that these products, when they're being produced, have developed dangerous byproducts that should not be inhaled. 
Uh, so we hear a lot about the products in the over-the-counter market and gas stations that can be pretty, pretty scary. Uh, so I don't personally recommend that anybody go and try them themselves. I say come to the medical marijuana program. Uh, however, if somebody has told me that they've tried Delta 8 and that's why they're here today, that's a little bit of a celebration that now we are getting products that are a little bit more safe, in my opinion. Because uh, the products in the medical program undergo third-party laboratory testing before the grower processor can even sell them to a dispensary. Uh, the testing in Pennsylvania's program is much more in-depth than what is required than the Farm Bill, and even a little bit more in-depth than what other states require. Uh, we test for pesticides, solvents, water activity, moisture content, the cannabinoid concentrations, uh, terpenes, mycotoxins, and our labeling is even required to indicate uh, some of this information as well. So basically, these products are a lot safer here. Um, so we're talking about patients who come into the dispensary uh, specifically for the first time or after a couple times, whether it's someone coming in after trying Delta-8 um, or who are even just prescribed a ton of other medications. I've heard from pharmacists that, specifically cannabis pharmacists, that they deal with um, patients who are overprescribed all of these prescription medications and kind of, can you take us through the process of uh, going through a medication list with a patient, um, potentially removing some of those and replacing with cannabis and how, how that all works? For sure. Um, so yeah, it's very, very common that patients come into the room and they want to get off all of these medications that they're on, specifically the opioids, the benzodiazepines, um, and anything else. Uh, Actually, a ton of patients want to get off of medications entirely and just use plant-based medicine instead. So fully in support of that. Um, unfortunately, I'm not able to recommend that they discontinue. That is a conversation they need to have with their prescriber who prescribes that medication. However, some of these like benzos and opioids, prescribers are a little bit willing to based off of the consequences of addiction of those. Um, so it, it certainly can be done. The best recommendation for withdrawing off of those medications is to decrease by 20% over two weeks until you're entirely off of them. And we can certainly manage that with cannabinoids. There's a lot of research out there that shows that cannabis uh, not only will treat the pain that we're suffering from, but can also help with the withdrawal symptoms that you would experience from opioids as well. Uh, so that is, that's how we would approach it. Did I fully answer your question? <laughs> Yeah, definitely. And I think some of the conversations that I've had, it's, it's kind of the, the pharmacist getting in touch with the, the prescribing doctor and kind of figuring out that plan of action as well. Um, so that definitely makes sense. Um, certainly understanding that the PAMMJ program is not perfect and kind of wanted to hear what are kind of some of your top things that you might want to change about the medical program moving forward? For sure. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of things that you could possibly want to change and tweak minor adjustments, but there are three major things that really stick out to me the most. The first is that edibles should be allowed in our program. The reason that we're not allowed to have them is because they're too appealing to children. Uh, there could be accidental ingestion as well, uh, but there's so much error in this logic because prescription medications and over-the-counter medications are allowed to and actually target children so that they will use them. I'm not sure if anybody has a child that is very, very difficult to give medication to, but they might not take it because of the taste or the pill size or for whatever reason. So I actually feel like we're really, really missing out on helping this demographic a lot more by providing them products that they want to use to, for their health. Um, another thing is that I definitely think we should allow patients to be able to grow their own medicine at home. To me, this is no different than the concept of growing your own herbs, your own vegetables, your own fruit, and being responsible for safely consuming them. Uh, and the patients are definitely, definitely asking for it. And then the last thing is to utilize a different electronic tracking system. As I speak right now, it's down across the state, or at least it was when we had first started. And this last occurred on Monday for us. Uh, this is the system that every single dispensary is required to use, every single grower processor is required to use to record our transactions per the Department of Health. Uh, this past Monday, we were actually down from 1.30 p.m. until the end of day, so every dispensary in Pennsylvania was unable to serve those patients, and we're not allowed to operate on a backup system either. Uh, this is something that wouldn't occur in traditional pharmacy. I was always able to have a backup system where I had worked to make sure that patients' needs were being met. And you know, a lot of patients will drive far for dispensaries because there are some areas that are very saturated, 
but oftentimes people are driving a distance to pick up their medication. They came on their lunch break or they sent their caregiver because they are debilitated and cannot come in. And now they're without their medicine. Um, also, just a, a kind of a side note is that it's, it's almost like the cannabis industry tried to recreate the wheel with some of the platforms that are available because we've been using electronic systems in pharmacies and hospitals for years with no issue. However, the ones that are available to us aren't as efficient and they aren't as secure. Uh, so those are definitely the three things I would change. Great. And in terms of edibles, I know you mentioned kind of the, the ease of access to children and kind of the reasoning why um, people have been against it. What are your recommendations to patients for safe storage, both for as well for the quality of um, the product, like the potency, making it last, but also kind of keeping it out of the hands of children to make sure that doesn't that accidental ingestion doesn't happen? Sure. I mean, this is kind of confusing to me because as a pharmacist, you would keep out. I just don't understand why patients aren't keeping their medications in appropriate areas and out of reach of children or even animals too. Um, so it's just as basic as I would store them with your prescription medications if you have them. Um, you can get a lockbox to keep them even out of reach of anyone that only you know the code to open up a lockbox. A lot of patients will do that. So it's just about being responsible with your medication. And then as well for uh, home grow, certainly kind of patient access being kind of a point an, an issue within the program. Um, but in terms of certainly there have been a lot of studies with cannabis and hemp being soil cleansers. And if people plant um, in contaminated, contaminated soil, you have kind of lead, arsenic, heavy metals. Um, are there any recommendations that you would have in terms of um, how to do that safely? Uh, something that comes to mind at all is that if there is going to be an issue about the safety of it, why don't we provide education? We could provide educational source resources to those who are going to grow at home, whether that be a class that they're required to attend or something that they can do in the privacy of their own home. Um, but the education, education is key. Definitely. And the other, the other interesting counterpoint that I've heard recently in, in some of these articles that I've been reading um, is that a lot of our fruits and vegetables are also soil cleansers, tomatoes and lettuce and things of that nature, and they do not go under the same kind of testing. So. Um, it's kind of an interesting way moving forward to kind of figure out and suss out what, what the actual um, harms are going to be from it, uh, mm -hmm. but certainly kind of creating some sort of way, accountability and, and training for people. Definitely agree there. Um, so definitely want to move on to another question about, um, are there any upcoming bills to amend the PAMMJ program that you like or dislike? Um, and are there any that you feel have a realistic shot of passing? So there are, there are a couple different bills out there. I want to first say that I am by no means an expert on the law, but as a pharmacist, I feel like it's my duty to advocate for patients for uh, a safe program um, as well as an appropriate program too. So I kind of have taken upon myself to be an advocate and to stick my nose into the legislation a bit. Um, but I believe there are about four Senate bills and seven House bills that affect the current program. And there's also a new adult use bill that would um, affect the medical marijuana, me the medical program as well. Um, so I actually do like the adult use bill. That's um, Senate Bill 846 by Street and Lachlan. And it establishes an adult use program that would absorb our medical marijuana program. It would automatically allow the current operators to begin selling to adult use within 180 days of being enacted. Uh, it would allow possession of up to 30 grams of cannabis, allow patients to medical patients to grow at home, and it expunges past convictions, as well as ensuring some social equity too. So overall, this is a bill that I think should be supported, um, and, and let's go for it. Another one is SB uh, 869 by Senator Street, which allows for home growth for the medical program. Patients would be allowed to have up to six flowering cannabis plants um, and I just think that's great. Like I said earlier, I think we should do it. <laughs> Another one is Senate Bill 538. It would allow for edibles. And as I mentioned, I think that that needs to occur too. Um, there's just a couple, a little bit of terminology in there that's a little bit confusing instead of helpful for cannabis patients. Uh, they rem remove some of the labeling terminology too. So it's a little gray. I'm not sure how well that would do. And then pretty much every bill that's proposed by the House is one that makes a minor tweak that aids and, and supports our patients. 
apps, such as allowing a temporary identification card and providing protection for patients, uh, whether they are leasing a house, leasing a commercial space, as well as with their employers. So those are all really, really great bills. Uh, there are two bills that I don't really care for, though. <laughs> I don't know if you want to talk about the, the ones that I liked first before moving forward, though. Yeah, definitely. Um, and actually wanted to take a step back, actually. Um, quick question from Professor Warner Simon um, asking about metric being the system now. I believe that Pennsylvania uses MJ Freeway and not metric. We do not use metric, correct. Yeah, so as of um, four o'clock, MJ Freeway was inoperable. Yeah, and in terms of the bills that you don't like, uh, which are the ones um, that you kind of um, are a little bit more hesitant, to, hesitant about? Sure. So uh, Senate Bill 773, which was uh, sponsored by Gebhardt, it aims to allow more dispensary permits as well as clinical registrants, uh, which would be beneficial for the permit holders um, if there were, which would be beneficial to the general population if the permit holders are required to open in underserved uh, areas. As I mentioned earlier, we do have a bit of a saturation right now. So, and we don't really have a need for additional dispensaries except for in those underserved areas. Um, another thought that I've had about this bill though, is that it would be extremely beneficial to pass it before Senate Bill 846, the adult use bill gets passed because the new uh, registrants would automatically be able to participate in adult use. Uh, another bill that I'm not too, too fond of is Senate Bill 835 by Senator Regan and Brewster. Uh, pretty much this bill does every single thing it can to turn our medical marijuana program into an adult use program without saying so. They limit a lot of things such as the qualifying conditions, renewing your medical card yearly, um, they're going to allow for advertising that does not need to be pre-approved by the department. Um, and lastly, they're going to allow dispensaries to substitute your pharmacist or physician with a medical assistant or a pharmacy technician. Uh, so I think it's a little easy to see where my bias lies there and why I'm a little perturbed by it. Um, however, I think that if you're going to propose an adult use program, just do it. Uh, don't change our medical program because that could really, really affect the health and outcomes for chronically ill patients who rely on this. Definitely, yeah. And in terms of um, that, it makes me think of a lot of people kind of, one criticism of the PAMMJ program is that they call it a pseudo adult use um, program. There are a fair amount of patients who, mm -hmm. they do have a qualifying condition, they do qualify for it, but they treat it more as an adult use program. Um, do you see that as valid and, and um, what are your, ideas to kind of fix that? I for sure see it valid. Um, just a little backstory about me. I wasn't always pro-cannabis. It took reading the research myself to get involved in the program and to change my mind. Uh, so I came from a very, very conservative approach to it. So certain things that I would be seeing as common practice that aren't allowed, uh, I would see regularly. Um, it's naive to think that patients are not combusting in Pennsylvania is one thing that I will state. Uh, and it's also naive to think that every single patient actually does have a qualifying condition. Um, I would refer back to the rules and regulations where patients must have the qualifying condition before they meet with the certifying doctor. And we're often finding that a lot of patients are then being diagnosed with it unofficially at the certifying uh, meeting. Uh, the two conditions that are most common to get into the program with and where I see this abuse are with chronic pain and anxiety. Um, certainly an old sports injury that you have may cause debilitating pain, but in the traditional practice, this would need to be documented by another physician first, not at your meeting with the, uh, with the certifying doctor. And the same goes for anxiety. There have been rumors on the street that uh, certain third party programs who refer you to your certifying doctor ask you to fill out a questionnaire asking you if you have anxiety. And it's not actually a diagnostic test for anxiety. And then that's how they're being referred to the certifying doctor for anxiety. Um, we have also, <laughs> it would also be naive to think that patients aren't purchasing for other people too. And so those are some of the areas where, you know, the regulations could really, really support us if there was a way to check and balance the regulations. 
Great. Um, so we do have a question again from our audience, um, kind of relating back to will I be able to uh, buy this product again? Um, has it been your experience that CBD dominant or one to one THC to CBD ratio products are not as frequently available? Um, I would say that that is that is certainly a trend. They are certainly not as common as our THC dominant products. They make up a minor portion of the products available at every dispensary. Um, unfortunately, that's the case for m maybe a couple reasons. Um, the grower processor might not have selected CBD dominant strains to harvest, or they might not have done very well while they were growing. So if a strain doesn't do very well, they can't produce enough medicine to make it to the dispensary. Um, we also had had issues early on with where we're able to get CBD as well. Um, early on in the program, we weren't, it wasn't very clear how we were able to get the CBD from harvest if the dispensaries weren't growing it themselves. Uh, so now I do believe that we are able to source CBD from other grower processors uh, to purchase in order to keep those products in more circulation. Great, and in terms of, um of how this all fits together on, on the bigger picture with um, adult use potentially being on the horizon, the medical program. What do you see the future being for the medical program? Or, or from your perspective as a pharmacist, um, what would what protections would you like or would you like it to get a little bit more strict um, to kind of help those medical patients to really see the available products? And um, how do you see all that playing out? Sure. I mean, my personal opinion is, is that anybody can use cannabis safely if they would like to. So even uh, in the midst of an adult use program, I still think that though there's a lot of value with a medical program and that it's very, very important for those patients. Uh, so in the future, regardless of what occurs, I would hope that uh, the integrity of the program remains and that medical patients are still given a priority, whether that comes to product availability to have the products that have more than just THC in it, that have other cannabinoids, that have the terpenes listed in a medical format, um, to make sure that those are available, not only available and that they're being made, but the medical patient gets the priority first over the adult use. That would be my wish. Great. And has there also been like, I know specifically for product forms, um, people don't necessarily like the inhalation aspect, certainly for the lung and heart, um, potential consequences. Um, have you seen any sort of kind of lack in availability across product forms, any that are more abundant or certainly that struggle? As of lately, I would say no. There was a time period that we did go through a flower drought and there was no dry herb anywhere to be purchased. So a lot of patients were going and trying all kinds of different products. But I do think that we, we have a pretty steady supply from our grower processors across the board of all the various available products. Great. Now, as we talk about kind of this mixture between legislation and, and policy as well with um, medical relief for patients, um, we talked about how the Department of Health and Human Services has provided this recommendation to DEA for rescheduling. Um, kind of wanted to get your take on what that potential impact would look like and um, how states, specifically Pennsylvania, would kind of deal with that. Yeah, so this has been making a lot of waves everywhere, and I've especially been following threads on LinkedIn about what everybody's saying on the benefits and drawbacks. I personally, or maybe optimistically, uh, really believe that this isn't a bad recommendation. Lowering the schedule can provide more access to patients and people in states that don't have access right now. And in areas where it's not decriminalized, future convictions will be less severe. Um, ideally, I think the idea is to entirely decriminalize um, so that we don't have convictions and that there is a lot more access to patients. Um, but ultimately, I don't really see how this could affect Pennsylvania's program or any other state's program. Currently, we're at a schedule one, so that's the most severe penalizing uh, schedule that you could be in. I don't think anything would change at schedule three with a lessening of the schedule. I, I believe that our programs will still be able to operate the way that they are. Yeah, and I, I found this interesting too, because with the move to schedule three, um, it, it would require a doctor prescription, not a recommendation. Is that correct? And how would that kind of work? I guess the, the programs would still kind of operate outside of federal jurisdiction. 
um, mm -hmm. under the state level. But um, do you see any sort of movement towards moving towards a prescription model or staying with the recommendation? Certainly that opens the door for uh, big pharma to establish more cannabinoid-based medicines to sell via prescription. I think that would just be added in addition instead of replacing our programs the way that they're run. Great. Now, in terms of um, how patients currently um, kind of interact with the program, I know that online ordering, certainly, as you mentioned, is very popular. Um, but for new patients um, or patients still really trying to find out which product is right for them, um, what guidance or advice can you give them in terms of um, kind of sticking to it or kind of best going about finding what works for them? Yeah, definitely. Uh, talk to people, research online. There are a lot of wonderful resources, especially the Conigma, uh, which can help answer any questions that patients might have. Definitely look for a science-based source similar to the Conigma um, that reviews the information because there's a lot of myths out there. Um, for finding the best product, I, I would recommend keeping a journal or a diary, something that reminds you why that product worked well for you, how you felt immediately after consuming it, and on a scale from one to 10, how much were your symptoms relieved? A um, couple other things that you could even jot down in there would, would be like, did you have any recent meals or anything else that might you might have consumed that day that could have an effect on how the medication worked in your body? Uh, those will give us clues to look back and see, okay, so we really liked Bubba Kush. That worked extremely well. And these are the cannabinoids that it contains. And these are the terpenes that it contains. So even if I don't have that Bubba Kush, I could say, okay, the granddaddy perp next to it has a very similar profile, both high THC, high mercy. These are wonderful choices for that particular patient. Um, so that's just an example of how we can find the next thing that might be a great substitute. Great. And in terms of adverse events, I know that this kind of goes along that, that route. You see a lot of people, particularly older people who are looking to get off medications, but they're also kind of have that anxiety towards not wanting to be too high. Um, mm -hmm. Certainly people can have those bad experiences and can turn them off to cannabis all entirely. Um, what are your recommendations for, for people to, um, certainly we went to, to avoid, but not to get discouraged by that and kind of understanding the different types of cannabis? Sure. It can be really, really discouraging to have an adverse event like an over medication or something like that and be anxious to start again. Um, some things that we can do is recommend using CBD to help prevent that. Consuming CBD at the same time as THC will prevent that high feeling but could still provide the same relief. You don't need to feel high to get the benefits of cannabis. That's kind of just an added benefit if you feel it, it's euphoric. But some people feel that it's dysphoric. Um, and so using both cannabinoids might be extra beneficial for the particular person. Um, another thing that we can try is switching up the route of administration. So if ingestion really just didn't work for you, it was very unpleasant and lasted too long, uh, we could try inhalation then if you're open-minded to it. Great. I also wanted to mention to the audience, feel, please feel free to uh, drop a question in the chat. Uh, got about 10 more minutes here and certainly wanted to see if anyone had anything out there. Uh, but another question, Lauren, is um, yeah. when it comes to uh, product um, or at least kind of the growing cycles, have you noticed any sort of trends as to when products can come online or is that really subject to kind of what the, the grower processors decide? That's really subject to the grower processors. It doesn't work the same way as the pharmaceutical industry does or how I worked in a retail pharmacy before where I can order specifically what I know I need the next day. Um, in this world, it's a little bit differently where the grower processor gives you a menu that, of items that they have available. Um, so those products have already passed the third party testing and are available for purchase. So there is kind of a, a different process. It has to pass the testing and then the dispensary has to ask for the product because um, there is, uh, to my knowledge, some bit of uh, deals that go on there or uh, certain fulfillments that are required between businesses. Great. And for the pharmacy consult, um, is there any cost to that? And kind of talking about potentially checking in every couple of months with the pharmacist on site? 
No, there's no fee at all. You can check in with a pharmacist at any time. Every single dispensary should have a unique pharmacist that is specifically there for you to be able to counsel with. Great. So we have a question from the audience here. Um, can you talk more about uh, what you learned that helped you become more pro-cannabis? Oh, sure. Uh, that's a great question. So back in 2018, I was reading and saw that we we're going to have a program in Pennsylvania. So I um, got to the internet and went for the research articles that were first way over my head. I didn't quite understand what I was reading at that level. So I went back to the basics and anything that I could get my hands on. Um, there's a book called Cannabis Pharmacy by Michael Backus that uh, most cannabis pharmacists have read by now uh, that introduces you to the different components of cannabis that are therapeutic, how cannabis works on the body, and how the body works on cannabis. It goes through a lot of the basics there. Uh, I even went to online sources such as Leafly or High Times just to understand the culture a bit more. Uh, and any other questions that would come my way, because I didn't know what a slice was when I first started working in the industry. Slang terminology for a unit of measurement. And so someone's asking me if they could have a slice. I'm like, I don't have any pizza here. <laughs> uh, so anything I could get my hands on. And then finally, at some point, I was able to understand the research articles and be able to regurgitate them to formulate my kind of practice style. Great. Um, another question from the audience. Uh, are there any other rec bills uh, other than SB 846 being brought before that you know of? Um, that is the only adult use bill that I am specifically familiar with besides the 835, which turns our medical program into one. Great. And actually for next month, for everyone listening, we will be having Meredith Butner for the Pennsylvania Cannabis Coalition next month to talk a little bit more about those bills. So definitely wanted to get your perspective on this as a pharmacist. I know that this um, aspect of it is very complicated and, and at least from what I have both read and watched from the testimony in the committees, uh, it sounds like they could use a little bit more of the pharmacist expertise in those discussions. Um, so always interesting to kind of get that perspective, both being in it every day as a pharmacist, and certainly working. I guess this is actually another question leading to it is, um, how much um, do you interact with the dispensary agents in terms of kind of helping them to give better recommendations? Because I know that's something that people are also a little bit weary of, not necessarily trusting the dispensary agent, but the pharmacist certainly comes with a little bit more uh, trust mm -hmm. built in. Yeah, I, I give our bud tenders or wellness guides, however, you, whatever you would prefer to call them, a ton of credit. Um, many of them are patients themselves who have taken it upon themselves to become an expert for their own health and journey. Um, they will know a lot of infor in depth information about the strains, recommend how to use them. However, there are some things that are just entirely over their heads, like specific medical conditions and things that we need to worry about with them or what a specific recommendation would be for somebody that's considered a high risk patient. Um, the bud tenders don't have education on the medications and the interactions to appropriately guide and counsel patients in that regard either. So uh, for the most part, I, I feel very, very confident that they can help make suggestions, but if there are specific concerns and worries, um, most of the, pretty much all of the bud tenders I've ever worked with know to come and grab me. I'm infamous for hanging out on the floor and listening in and butting in if necessary. Um, but these days, I, I don't really have to. I work with a very, very talented team, as I would like to believe most other pharmacists do in dispensaries. Great. Um, how many people uh, come and meet with a pharmacist on average, would you say? Um, you know, this has really changed over the years. Uh, initially in the program, almost every single initial patient was asking for one. Uh, those who might have had previous experience might not need the pharmacist. I would say that it would depend on the store, but I, I see at least five patients a week. Uh, and, and I would say that's, that's a lot considering that we have about, what, 400K patients in the program and not all of them are new anymore. The rates of new patients are declining. Yeah, definitely. We've seen that in, in some of our enrollment numbers on the registry study that um, really the, the 
2019, 2020, 2021 were really kind of peak years and um, 2022 and 2023, it feels like um, haven't been getting many new patients. Uh, but certainly it's something that whenever someone comes to me to talk about cannabis, given that working in research and having been a dispensary agent, it's something that's a little bit um, hard for them to understand where the information comes from and certainly understanding that you can talk to a pharmacist and and having that it's very reassuring to people um and i think with people who are very concerned about the effects that they're going to get whether it's either based in stigma or based in the kind of the realistic aspects of it um working with a pharmacist to understand drug interactions understand absorption understand dosing um, and then even navigating those trickier times when that one product that you've been getting for so long is no longer in stock. Um, and I find that at least when you go to like Leafly, like you had previously mentioned, and another site, Allbud, that some of the dispensary agents would use, it's really good to understand and track lineages. Um, how much of that comes into what you do uh, as a pharmacist is knowing those lineages as well? Um, lineages can be important, uh, to give you a sense of what effects to expect. So, you know, we cross two strains in order to get a brand new one and we can imagine what their, the effects could be. Lineage isn't that important to the pharmacist though. I'm looking at the chemovar. I'm looking at the chemical profile that that is what is giving me the information on how that product is going to work in that person's body, not necessarily the parents names. Um, if that answers. Yeah, definitely. Um, now, I think we have question or time for one last question. Um, in terms of um, kind of like myths or kind of frequently asked questions or, or stereotypes, stigmas, myths that you come across dealing with patients, are there any that kind of come to mind in terms of stuff that you typically have to deal with? Um, I need... I don't get asked a whole lot of the myth questions, I, I would say, I, but I, I do have to spend a lot of time explaining to patients that if a tincture doesn't contain alcohol, it might not be absorbed underneath your tongue. Uh, that's a common kind of uh, misconception in the program. Traditionally, tinctures are supposed to contain alcohol, but it's also a term that's used loosely in herbalism to describe anything that might have been extracted from a plant. Um, so, some can be absorbed underneath your tongue, but not every single one will be. So it's usually likely better to swallow them. Another one is that if you eat mangoes while you consume cannabis, you'll feel higher. <laughs> uh, that's just certainly not true. But the idea is that myrcenes also contain a terpene called um, myrcene in them. And myrcene is known for, uh, or it's postulated that it can enhance the high that you're feeling. In rodents, it was shown to uh, enhance the blood-brain barrier so that more um, compounds could penetrate and cause that intoxicating feeling. This hasn't been proven in adults, uh, in humans, and I also have this hunch that if it was true, we wouldn't be allowed to eat in mangoes anymore. Great, and actually there was one more question that came to mind. Um, you had mentioned before um, when kind of keeping track of, of your cannabis use um, to ask a patient if they had eaten a meal recently. Um, mm -hmm. What's the significance of that uh, that you could explain? For sure. So uh, any food intake will slow down how quickly you notice the effects, but prolong that duration of action. Um, so I usually tell first timers to take it on an empty stomach. That way, you know how quickly your body metabolizes it without any distractions. Um, and then you can use food as a tool if you would like to. If you've noticed any changes in the way an ingestible is acting, it's probably because you had a recent meal. Great. All right. Thank you very much, Lauren. This has been a great presentation. Thank you for joining us. Um, everyone else, next, uh, our next speaker series will be on October 5th. Uh, we'll be sending out an email probably tomorrow, if not early next week, for RSVP for that. It'll be with Meredith Butner, the Executive Director of the Pennsylvania Cannabis Coalition. Uh, I'm going to be talking a little bit more in depth about some of those bills that are going to be happening, um, as well as digging in um, to the rescheduling potential. Um, thank you all. Thank you, Lauren. Have a great rest of your week. Thank you, guys. Take care.